This rather humble looking key for the BSA Gold Star 650 actually contains an antenna for the immobiliser. When I slot this into the ignition barrel, it actually deactivates the immobiliser allowing the bike to be started. That's quite a handy and little nifty security feature on a bike of this price point. The handlebars actually are dampened by two conical rubber mounts that sit in the top yoke and this actually prevents vibration pretty much completely through the mirrors and the handlebars. That's a really nice feature on a bike that costs £6,000 and has a very vibey and characterful 650cc single cylinder engine. Finally, most people assume there's actually three 12 volt accessory ports on the BSA Gold Star 650. You've got a USB-A and a USB-C on the handlebars. You've also got a 12 volt Switch Live universal accessory port on the left-hand side of the bike. And the hidden and fourth accessory port is actually inside the headlight cluster. You can wire up from there heated grips or fog lights or other accessories that will you benefit from a Switch Live. These are the kind of things we're going to talk about in this review and it's the kind of things that only an owner would know. Okay, so let's dive into the ownership review of the BSA Gold Star 650. We want to give maximum value in the shortest amount of time. Ownership reviews, of course, offer more detail than someone doing a demo ride at a dealer. I know about reliability, about riding conditions on different road surfaces, different weather, different seasons. I know about warranty, uh, dealer experience any problems that have come up in reliability. All this you won't get on a kind of demo bike style review. The other thing about being an owner is I've already paid my money. Money's gone. I can't get that back now. So <laughs> this is now my bike to do with what I want, but also to talk about it in any manner I want. So if I say it's bad or good or neutral, no one's gonna have any opinion and reach out to me and should we say, massage my opinion into a slightly more positive light. Okay, we're going to talk about what to pay for this motorcycle. Probably the most important thing is the value proposition. As owners and motorcyclists, we've got a set budget and the manufacturers have to make a bike that basically meets those requirements and that we feel willing to invest quite a sizable sum in. Now, for the BSA Gold Star, you're looking at six grand for a new one. And that's the Highland Green model, which you see here in front of you, but also the new for 2024 Shadow Black model, which is kind of base model, but blacked out essentially. If you want to pay a little bit more, six and a half grand for the stripes. Um, we call them the stripes because they include the Midnight Black, the Insignia Red, and the Dawn Silver bikes that have a stripe down the tank and also on the rear fender. Now, there is a higher tier called the Legacy Edition, and the Legacy bikes are about seven grand, but they actually include quite a number of, of, of co cosmetic upgrades. It's not just the chrome tank and the chrome fender on the Legacy, you've also got handlebars which are chrome, mirrors that are chromed, brake lever, or brake pedal, clutch lever, pegs, all of that has been upgraded and, and made in a nicer finish. Engine covers are polished, so they look a lot better than this kind of gray powder coat you got here. You got chrome bar end mirrors and the headlight and the cell, the instrument cluster, the forks, indicators, they're all gloss black which really improves the kind of premium finish to the bike. So if you want that kind of top end BSA, get the legacy straight out of the, out of the bat basically. Don't go for one of these and upgrade it. Um, if you do fancy the polished engine covers in particular, just go for a legacy. Now, where's the real value in the BSA? I think, at the time of making this video, that nearly new bikes are where it's at. So if you think, I bought this back in September, six months old, 227 miles on it, and I paid five and a half grand. That is amazing value for what you get. You bet basically, the only big single thumper on the market, BSA Heritage, the looks, the little attention to detail, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing value proposition. I, I think it's fantastic. However, if you buy new, then you're obviously a little bit a higher price point. Now, we'll fast forward six more months from making this video in March or almost April 2024, you can get these for under five grand, with under a thousand miles on them. And it also doesn't seem to be variant specific. So you can get Highland Green for five grand, but you could also get a Legacy Edition for five grand with under 500 miles on it. So price point, I think we're, 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 we are where we need to be with BSA now. They did 
adjust the pricing at the turn of this year, which is probably a good move from BSA. They've dropped it down a little bit from 6.8 for the baseline to 6. And that brings it in line with the Interceptor. Obviously there's new competition out now, like with the Triumph 400 range. So BSA being a little bit clever, dropped the price, new year, and this bike here in front of me, yeah, brilliant. The second most important thing that we should talk about in an owner's review is reliability. And I'm gonna be completely honest about this. When the bikes were first launched in March 2023, there were a number of problems that early adopters experienced with these motorcycles. The principal one, and the one that concerned the most people was engine stalling. And the situation was if you've taken the bike out for a bit of a spirited blast and you pulled up at stationary traffic or at a junction, the engine would cut out. And it was to do with the fuel map. Obviously these Euro 5 bikes run really lean. You can tell that by the bluing on the exhaust. Super hot and super lean fuel mix. And they obviously hadn't got it quite right. Maybe they tested it and developed in India. And people were rightly really annoyed about this. There is an update to the ECU that was supposed to cure that. I think in most cases it did. I've read comments saying that people taking the bike into dealer had the update and it had resolved it. In my case, I'm running a 72 plate bike. That's super early. Mine's probably one of the first to come off the production line. And I haven't had any problems with stalling. There were also other isolated cases which were assembly line errors like one owner had a fuel leak, which obviously for him was very serious and it catalyzed his decision to actually offload the bike after six months of ownership. Another quirky problem that happened on early bikes, the headlight would actually shatter of its own accord. And that was because the little wire clips that secure the headlight into the chrome ring at the front of the motorcycle were actually under too much tension. And it was a weakness that just shattered your headlight. Now, in fairness, dealers replaced this free of charge under warranty, of course, and they were usually replaced quite quickly. Again, the assembly line has been updated to take that into account, and now there's no more re reports of headlights shattering. Another issue which came on on early bikes was the engine management light was coming on, and it was usually associated with cold weather. Now, that happened on the Royal Enfield Meteor 350 to me personally and it also happens on the new Triumph 400s. Oh, tell a lie, that's an immobilizer light, stops the bike starting. So it seems all of these bikes that are developed in India, they seem to have little quirks with the engine management and the fuel map and the ECU as they come to launch. Usually these get resolved in time, but I think being an early adopter, that's now part of the parcel with Euro 5. I've had my engine management light on once, sorry, twice, uh, the first time was when I crashed the bike and it, there's actually a little gyro sensor in there that kills the engine when the bike falls on its side. When I righted the bike, turned the ignition on, I had an engine management light, but that light actually reset as I went through three cycles of turning the bike on, going for a ride and turning the ignition off. After three goes round, it reset like it's meant to. The other time my engine management light came on was when I rushed the startup procedure. So if you don't know, you're meant to turn the key to ignition uh, on, position one, sit on the bike, side stand up, and you're meant to let the clock sweep from one o'clock all the way around and back, wait for the engine management light to go out, then thumb the starter. And if you do that, you'll never get an engine management light on. So most of the faults are actually I hate to say it, but they were the owners not following the instructions for the engine management light issue. That engine management light doesn't affect the running of the bike, it's just obviously a pain for anyone who wants their bike running perfectly. So if you're looking at a bike now in 2024, I think probably They've come through that slightly awkward first six months where there were reliability issues. Now these bikes are pretty, pretty solid, is my opinion as an owner. If anything comes up on mine, I'll report it on this channel. So yeah, basically stay tuned. Okay, let's talk about this bike's main weaknesses. Probably number one is the tires. I think the Pirelli Phantom Sport Comps are a little bit suspect, shall we say. This has also been reported by Royal Enfield Interceptor owners and Triumph T100 Bonneville owners. The, the OE spec Pirellis are 
just not very grippy. They just they just seem a little bit unnerving when you're cornering. So I'd probably swap these out for something like Avon Road Riders that a lot of people do choose instead. Number two, probably the rear shocks. Not actually an issue for me personally because I'm 80 kilos and I don't ride the bike aggressively. I'm more of a plodder. But if you are a larger rider and you want to press on, then the damping is a little bit weak at the rear. And that's something a lot of people have done uh, as an aftermarket upgrade to their bikes. It's Hagon, it's Tech, it's Skirling. They're basically easy to change. You can do it with simple tools and a lot of people do swap out the rear shocks. Hagon probably would be the best bet. Another weakness of overall ownership of the bike is spare part availability. It's quite hard to get spare parts from India over to the UK. They don't stock all of them at the Fowler's distribution center in Bristol. For example, this mudguard, when I crashed the bike, I needed to replace a Highland Green mudguard. It took five weeks to arrive, so I had to source it from an aftermarket a bike shop, basically. Um, I would say that this will probably improve over time, and it's something that affects all manufacturers. But if you do have a need for spare parts to replace damaged items, then be prepared to wait, essentially. Same story with the accessories. It's a bit hit and miss whether you can get apparel like hoodies, the, the baseball caps, that kind of thing. Luggage, you've got to go to a dealer and they might not have it in stock. It's also quite expensive. So I'd say spare parts, accessories, on the bike, apparel, it's all a bit hit and miss. The other main glaring omission from the bike is of course the centre stand. People have been saying for as long as this bike's been available that it needs a centre stand. The issue with that is that the ABS pump is located just under there. Be careful not to touch the exhaust. And that means that aftermarket companies like Hitchcock's are a little bit hesitant to go and fiddle around down there or produce a kit that requires owners to relocate or modify ABS pump because it's an essential safety feature. So the fact you've got the ABS pump in there makes it harder to produce a center stand. BSA haven't done it as an optional extra and the aftermarket hasn't yet done it, although we do hear that there's a guy in the east of England, Dave's Bike Shed, who has developed one and he sold five already and none of those, uh, that product isn't even on the market and he sold five of them. So people want a center stand, the Royal Enfield Intercept has got a center stand, Triumph can be fitted with a center stand, BSA have made a bit of a slip up by not fitting this bike with a center stand. So let's talk about the fit and finish of the BSA. Um, I think it's got a really premium feel to it, especially for the price point. You've got things like the chrome accents here, you've got the BSA branding in the headlights and inside the instrument cluster. Brembo brakes there, the, the fit and finish is just, just a little bit above the kind of price point that you expect. I won't go and say it as far as to say it's Triumph level, but it is it is up there. Little touches like the warning light inside the headlights. The BSA badge there is kind of like a gel embossed badge that protrudes. Got chrome, lovely fuel filler cap. The seat's nice and big and comfortable with BSA stitching on it. So far, I've rode my bike in all weathers and I haven't noticed any deterioration of the parts, the fasteners it hasn't really tarnished in my ownership and I've left this bike outside for the last month. So I think it's well put together and I think it's a quality bike that you can be proud of. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the best accessories for the BSA Goldstar 650. Obviously being in a modern retro, this kind of style of motorcycle lends itself really well to customization, whether it be Royal Enfield, whether it be Triumph or BSA. People love to make these bikes their own. I'd probably say the best accessory, and I've got a few, but the best is probably the fender extender. Little inexpensive piece of plastic, makes your fender a little bit longer and stops crap flying up and sticking into your radiator. I know Mr. Darcy and the old man on their channel, one of the first things they look about on a classic bike is how big the mudguard is. And I kind of agree with it. I want a mudguard that stops my radiator getting caked in crap. So you don't have to clean it, but it also increases the longevity of your radiator. Another nice inexpensive modification, which you can probably see down here, if my leg's not in the way, we've got the more speed racing sticker set. And one of the cheaper looking parts of the bike is actually the standard stickers, just a little clear plastic transfer that says BSA down there. If you upgrade to these stickers, you get one on each of the engine casings, and they actually provide one for the fuel filler cap. 15 quid and you get the same embossed kind of gel sticker that matches the tank. I think that makes the bike look a lot more premium and it's very inexpensive. 
So well done more speed racing for bringing that little gadget out to market. The third accessory I found really, really useful is the classic bike racks rear rack, specifically designed for BSA Gold Star. It's about 80 or 90 pounds, but its utility, these guys just having a chat, going past, but its utility is really unrivaled. You can strap anything to it from a tent to a tripod, to a, a hold all luggage. It's just really, really useful. So I'd probably bolt one of those onto, onto my BSA. Mine came with it but I'm over the moon with it, I find it really useful. Also has a little raised bit there, which acts to give the pillion a little bit more security. You can't slide off as easily. The fourth upgrade I definitely recommend is some kind of exhaust system bypass of the cat. Obviously, modern manufacturers have to fit catalytic converters. As owners, we don't really appreciate them on the bike because they add weight, they dull the exhaust notes, and they actually sap the power a little bit as well. What you can do is fit a straight through conversion just coming from the cylinder here to the exhaust silencer and that's what I fitted that's a Hitchcock's decap pipes 192 pounds including that tech also offer a full system it's about 220 or 265 pounds depending on configuration that includes the silencer as well so you get from the cylinder all the way through quite a weight saving on that system and finally more speed racing also offer a numerous uh, array of options with silencer styles but also a decat for the front and that ranges from 500 pounds to 560 pounds but it's polished stainless steel or um, mild steel but chrome plated so anything where you modify the exhaust is going to be a, a real uplift in the character of the bike and I'll, i've got some sound recordings which i'll just play over the video uh, just so you can hear how this bike actually sounds Right guys, now it's time for the ride on section of this review. So we're gonna go on the bike, have a ride around, get you a feel for what it's like to ride. As with anything though, please make your own mind up. Either listen to multiple reviews or even better, go and test ride one of these bikes at a dealer. You've probably ridden more bikes than I have. You've probably been riding longer than I have. So there's no substitute for your own informed opinion. If you want to watch the next section, please enjoy it. If not, then I'll meet you at the conclusions and summary. He's having a wild time, isn't he, on his push bike? So we're out on the BSA Gold Star. I'll just give you a few thoughts on what it's like actually to ride the bike. So first things first, the, the view ahead is particularly delightful. I really, really like the rider's POV on this bike. So obviously the highlight is the instrument cluster. The clocks sweep from one o'clock around clockwise. You've got two pods there, chrome rings on the outside. Just like the little touches like miles per hour and RPM times 100. You know, isn't that a little bit more authentic than having a button that you press and it just switches from kilometers to, to miles? Really, really nice. Up the front there, you've got the morning light display, and it's built into the headlight mount. I think that's really nice because it, it pivots the, the warning lights coming up far and out in front of you, as opposed to being right here. And so that means they're quite easy to see. Now, some people have complained that they're a little bit dim. I personally don't think they are. Um, where it gets a little bit less nice, I guess, is the controls here. They are quite plasticky. Uh, especially the buttons here if you look in the sunlight I've got the sun in front of me but if you look in the sunlight you've got a little bit of a sheen to the buttons the plastic and um, if you think Royal Enfield have recently upped their game a lot with the instrument uh, handlebar controls with the brushed or I think it's like a satin aluminium that's really nice and so I think BSA in the next iteration of this bike they've got to upgrade that a little bit I mean it all feels nice to use it's just aesthetically it's not great you have got a little trip meter which if i press this button i'll cycle through trip a trip b and the total odometer reading how many miles the bike's traveled uh, since factory on the handlebars 
And on the grips there, you've got BSA branding, which is quite nice. You don't have the Coke bottle grips that you do with the newer Royal Enfield. So they're a little bit more plain, but still they say BSA on them, they do the job. You've got bar end weights, and then you've got the Mickey Mouse mirrors. So to quote the all year motorcyclist, the mirrors are the, uh, the Mickey Mouse type and they're okay. I mean, they're nothing special. I will probably eventually upgrade to bar end mirrors. I just think being a little bit further out, you'll have a little bit more of a view. Whereas here, I'm kind of looking at my shoulder a lot of the time, which is a little bit of a, of a bugbear of mine. Let this guy go around me, I think. It's always a pain when someone's um, right up your bum on a review. Yeah, I've got to be careful here. Do you see me? Yes. Let's talk about the comfort when you're riding the BSA around. What does it feel like? So first things first, I would never change the seat on this bike. It's just so plush. I really, really like it. Susie will actually comment later about the pillions experience of uh, sitting on this seat. But all things considered, it's, it's just a really lovely, kind of juicy, <laughs> sumptuous seat. <laughs> And um, that is really, really one of the good points about the BSA, it's super comfortable. The other thing to mention is your feet are, are kind of in a really relaxed position. I mean, traditional grip bike style, mid foot controls, nice and low, you know, nothing really to, to discomfort you at all. If we re reflect a little bit on the suspension, now the rear suspension is a little bit denigrated shall we say by the community but as is the Royal Enfield interceptor uh, suspension people always change those out for Hagons or Girling or even the tech items BSA is kind of similar it's budget suspension it's a spring over a dampener nothing really to report either way about it I found that after 1125 miles on this bike the rear shocks have started to just kind of bed in a little bit I find them not that bouncy, but then I don't push the bike round corners and everything that hard. I'm, I treat it more as a as a cruising bike, not a bike to be sort of raced and rallied. So for me, I don't exceed, and at 80 kilos, I don't exceed the dampening of the rear suspension. I've got no pogoing or anything going on. I actually want soft suspension. That's, that's my preference in the motorcycle. So I want to be comfortable and they do that for me. Where it gets a little bit different is the front forks. They actually are a little bit crashy when you go over potholes and um, rough tarmac. I mean, I haven't got any of that here, so nothing to worry about. But because the springs are linear, you don't have um, that sort of soft initial uh, cushioning as you go over a, a undulation in the road surface. So I'll probably change those out, but you can get a kit and you can adjust the preload as well if you change the, the tops here on the suspension turret. Uh, that kit's from Tech, so you do get a... a uh, if you're wondering what that is, that's two wheels down, that's what that symbol is that bikers over here in, um, in Europe give. So suspension and seat position for me is fine. I might go the route of changing the, the front forks eventually, but it's not a pressing concern. There's other things I would probably do before doing that. Whilst we're on the subject of the handling and things I would change, I would definitely change the OEM tyres. I originally was a little bit of a non-believer in this rumour that Pirelli Sport Comp Phantom tyres were different, shall we say, when fitted as an OEM equipment part to the tyre that you buy actually in a dealership or a, a tyre supplier and fit to your bike um, as an aftermarket change. I didn't believe that rumour um, and then I happened to crash my bike in mysterious circumstances owing to a, a front wheel washout at 20 miles an hour around a bend just like this bend really. I was coming up here, yep, 20 miles an hour round the bend and all of a sudden I was up on the curb. So it's it's a funny uh, situation and it was due to losing grip at the front. I've since then, oh, another false neutral. Since then I've looked at the front tire and it does look a little bit 
old, it looks a little bit worn. It's actually a, a 2019 manufactured front Pirelli. So it's a little bit kind of cracked and not at its best really. Now that's something I would probably caution if you go and look at these bikes, you're gonna buy one. Look at the age of the front tire and the condition of the front tire. So I think very early models when they were delayed in production due to the pandemic, early models, they probably sat around for a while with shipping not possible. Because um, don't forget that Mahindra bought BSA in 2016 and they've been trying to get a bike to market since then. So I think I've got a slightly old front tire on, on there and that probably contributed to a lack of grip. It doesn't feel that planted when you go around corners and push on. And so what I'm doing, I'm just enjoying this rubber here in nice warm climate. My tire's always at temperature. But if I get back to the UK, I'm 100% going to change out for probably some Avon Road Riders or, or a Metzler or even some some knobbly tyres. I mean, at least then I'd expect not to have any grip. So yeah, tyres are a concern on the BSA Gold Star. But brakes, however, are not. Um, the, the front brake has got a lot of bite. It's a Brembo, 300mm front discs. Front disc or disc? Discs, from memory. The rear, as I mentioned in my review, well, my demo, on my demo bike, the rear wasn't that good, but reflecting on it here, just give it a little whirl. Yeah, it's not great, but it, it's probably better than the bike I had previously. Again, it's had to bed in a little bit. So the brakes are fine. Obviously, the non-adjustable levers, like I mentioned before. But... <laughs> oh, dear. The where this bike really excels is the engine and there's a few reasons for that one of which is that it's a single and it's the only bike on the market with such a engine configuration in a modern retro obviously we all know that the engine is a rotax design unit it debuted on bikes like bmw f650 funduro and it really suits it suits kind of a plodder because it's got loads of torque low down it's actually got a slightly lower bhp output than the royal enfield interceptor but a, a slightly higher torque figure and that's because obviously with a single you've got less top end but you can just pull away <laughs> and it just it's just really really good interestingly hitchcock's told me that um they dynoed a Royal Enfield inset to Anna BSA Gold Star. And, and both bikes were quite similar in power output. Very, almost like a, a hair's breadth between them, that's what they told me. So yeah, very, very, very close in power output if you are considering these two bikes. I personally don't think they're that close in other aspects. They look the same, they've got the same power output. But I would say the riding experience is, is pretty different. Royal Enfield seat not as comfortable as BSA's and the way the engine makes the power is it's just totally different so if you want to press on open the throttle you've got a glorious soundtrack especially because I've now added the decap pipe also from Hitchcock's but it just sounds really cool listen to that could you get a more old school feeling than a kind of clattery single cylinder <laughs> it's just amazing and everything just began to bed in now. I'm coming up to 1200 miles. It all just, all the vibration and character all just feels, it all just feels like it's meant to be, like be there. I'm just keeping it on the boil here at 4,000 RPM. Bear in mind it doesn't actually go up to 10. That's a little bit of a misnomer. It only goes up to seven before you hit the rev limiter on this, uh, this single cylinder. Whoa, <laughs> here we go. Now you've only got five gears, um, so that'll bug you a little bit if you want to do ex high speeds, uh, extended um, extended duration, if you want to go on the motorway for a while. So yeah, it's an old engine design, 25 years old, so they, they didn't at that time probably value the six gear perhaps as much as uh, now seems to be commonplace. One thing about um, the engine vibration is, BSA have actually done something very clever. They've put little conical rubber mounts in, in here 
um, that, that locate the handlebars. So you've actually got almost like an hourglass machined out of the top yoke and then two conical rubbers that then pull in with a bolt at the bottom and, and a washer. And it means the handlebars are securely located, but they're very, very well damped. And this is something that now expensive bikes are beginning to cotton on to. Weirdly, it seems like a cheap and easy fix to reduce vibration in the mirrors and the bars. And I read a review of Suzuki's GSX 1000 GX, you know, the, the tall rounder. And they were talking about handlebar damping with rubber. And I remember this bike's got it at about £5,900. And also the little keyway I test rode had it because you had bar end mirrors and they had rubber, a rubber spacer to stop vibration through the mirrors. So it seems like it's a very clever and cost effective way to reduce vibration in the bars. Really, really good. So I don't have any problem with vibration. I can see everything out of the mirror. Obviously the angle is a bit funny, but when I am looking at a vehicle in my rear view, I can, I've got no, uh, no vibration. I don't get any white knuckles or anything. Give it some. Whew. So that was really fun. It is enough just to get like the pulse racing. Obviously it's 45 horsepower. Uh, it's not a sports bike, but it's enough to, it's enough to hit the turn up, isn't it? It's just that engine noise. It's just so addictive. And you don't get it, you don't get it in a twin. So I'm sorry, but that's my view. You've got a twin cylinder, it's not the same. Just the same, the twin is not the same as an inline four. You know, if you want to scream in 600, you get an inline four. The box is really nice as well, because it's really kind of like notchy. It's got that old school feel to it. The only thing I can compare it to is, I rode a Harley Davidson Fat Bob and that was like clunking two big pieces of metal together and it's it's not quite as robust as that but it has got like a nice clunk when it goes into gear it doesn't have any what uh, sort of wishy washiness to it. it feels like it's in uh, never get bored of it <laughs> well then field uh, him there eh? Let's uh, talk about servicing. So you do a first service after 500 miles. It's a single, so ideally servicing costs won't be that high. I mean, I've looked at reports and we're talking 120 to 150. And that's including the, the valve check, the oil filter, uh, oil change, air filter. Is there a filter on the first service? Don't think it is. I think it's just basically an oil, oil fluid check of the bike and probably check the, the valve clearance from cold. Then you've got three and a half thousand miles for the next check, which uh, is a little bit short. So you've got three and a half thousand miles or 5,000 kilometers ish for uh, each service, the sort of minor service. The valve clearance check is after 14,000, 13,750 rings a bell. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen if I got it wrong. So I don't think this bike's particularly bad on service. You're going to be doing it every three and a half thousand miles and you probably won't build up that many miles on this bike that rapidly Because most of the riders on these bikes they're doing it um, three what a thousand miles a year People aren't doing very high mileage on these bikes So what I'd probably suggest doing if you are interested in one of these is picking up a nearly new one Because you're gonna get I would say Five grand and that's gonna give you a bike with under 500 miles on it. Obviously, as this review ages, you'll find that there's less bikes with uh, such low mileage available. This is this is obviously when the bike's been in the market a year. You're finding there's quite a lot of bikes available for purchase at that low mileage. <laughs> Do a loop around here. You can see this is the beautiful thing. You can see around the bends in these countries because there's no tall hedgerows. Never get bored of that sound, do you? 
I love that it's running now as well. Really, really good. So yeah, you could get a bike for five grand or you could buy a new Highland Green for six grand. Phantom Black or Shadow Black, that's also six grand. Some people do like the blacked out look. And then the other bikes, the Stripes, which we call the Dawn Silver, the Insignia Red and the Midnight Black. They've got the Stripe. I didn't like the Stripe, so I didn't buy one of the Stripes. They're uh, another 500 quid on top, I think. And then you've obviously got the Legacy Edition. The tank's 13 litres, which isn't particularly big. And I tend to get 120, 130 miles out of a tank. And I don't ride that aggressively. I, I, this is probably me having a spirited ride, what you've seen in the video today. So all in all, I don't think it's that expensive a bike to to maintain. You've got a single cylinder, everything's accessible, you've got no fairings to get, to get through. Servicing is quite inexpensive at dealers. You could probably service it yourself. I think BSA let you get away with that and under the warranty as long as you use genuine parts. You're covered if you buy a 23-year model bike by a four-year warranty. They call it a two plus two warranty, but as I understand it, it's four years. If you buy a brand new one though, a 24 bike, they've reduced it back to two years. What the hell? Why would they do that? CFMoto et al are giving a four year warranty, so why wouldn't you just stick with that? But never mind. So if you are going to buy a bike and you do worry about warranty, then buy a second hand 23 plate bike. You're laughing because you've got the balance of the four year warranty, which is, what, three and a half years. And you're saving money as well. And the bike will be pretty much new because it'll be uh, go around these cyclists, very, very low mileage on it. So there's a lot to love about the BSA Gold Star, there really, really is. This is my own bike, so I've got no allegiance or not owing to a dealer or anyone like that. I'm riding this out in Mallorca, no one's lent it to me. I'm not on kind of commission from BSA or anything like that, just a straight up. This is my thought about the bike. Um, fundamentally though, where else are you going to get a retro big single? And if you've got Royal Enfield Meteor, like I had, and you want to upgrade something with a bit more power, then this is honestly such a good successor to that bike. And I'll be keeping it. I really, really like it. Really, really like this bike. So guys, thanks a lot for listening. I didn't probably cover everything I wanted to in that review, but if you do have any questions, then drop them down in the, in the comments below. Like everything, people on here, we're just human. We do forget to say things from time to time. We do mess up our words. And so, um, yeah, if I've forgotten anything, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it in the comments. Well, now you join me at the end portion of this video for my summary comments about the BSA. So I've been an owner now for six months. I've done 1200 miles on the bike and honestly, it just gets better and better and better. I mean that literally in the fact that the engine's more running, that feels like I've got a little bit more punch and power, but also I'm just getting more and more a fan of the bike. And I really, really don't in any way regret my decision to invest in one of these. People who've watched the channel know I paid five and a half grand for it. It had 227 miles when I bought it. And I think the value proposition, if nothing else, it just blows everything else out of the water. You could buy a Triumph Bonneville for double this money and you would have a bike that might make you feel good, but it wouldn't be double as good as the BSA. You could buy an Interceptor, which would be similar experience to the BSA, but it wouldn't have the thumping single cylinder. It just has a parallel twin that thrums along. This thumps. So I found myself just looking at the bike more as I walked past, I turned my head, and I kind of have to keep pinching myself that this is my motorcycle. How lucky am I to have this bike? And really, if you love a modern classic, you don't really need anything else. You got a comfy seat, nice riding position, enough power for the road, good brakes, nice little detail features on the clocks, the way they sweep and the badge and the engine and everything. Yeah, it's not perfect. You know, the engine, they could dress up a little bit more. They could probably improve the rear brake, swap the tires, rear shocks. We know all that now, we know that. I think for the price point, if you are on the fence about it, just go ahead and take the plunge now. Go, go to a dealer, test ride them, see what you think about it yourself. But I think once you've test rode it, 
and now we're 12 months down the line and you've got less worries about reliability and issues and that kind of thing if you like it just go ahead and, and make the decision to, to invest i just think they're brilliant if you want to pay less money buy one nearly new as i did they're absolutely fantastic value if you own a meteor 350 or classic 350 and you want a little bit more power then you don't think super meteor think bsa because the engine character is basically the same as that bike it's 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 just a lovely upgrade path, I think, from the Royal Enfield 350s. So for me, I was born in the late 80s. I missed BSA the first time round, and now I just feel like you know my dreams have come true. I've got a bike which is retro. It suits my riding style. It's got a BSA badge on the tank. People come up and talk to me about it. The accessories are starting to come through. We got an extended warranty. I mean, what's not to like? So guys, if, if you want to know anything about the bike, then just let me know. I'll do my best to answer all the questions, but I'm, I'm a happy owner and I, yeah, I feel that this bike is the one for me. All right, guys, I'll catch you in the next video.